He's a country music songwriter, performer, whose songs have hit the top of the charts. He's now an author whose book has hit the top of the charts, and he's a speaker. I just heard him speak at an event here in Nashville for the Salvation Army. I'm talking, of course, about Jimmy Wayne. Mm -hmm. So, Jimmy, thanks for, uh, for talking with me. Thank um, you so much. And we just saw, I just saw your movie on TV as well. So your, your other book, Paper Angels, was made mm -hmm. into a TV movie, and I noticed you had a cameo appearance in that <laughs> as well. So, uh, but based on this list of accomplishments, life is good. Um, life is great. You've had um, this incredible life. And yet if you go back to your childhood, you wouldn't quite describe it in the same way. It seems, um, you know, you, I read your book and I think tragic, I think sad, I, 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 I'm just wrapped up in it. How would you describe uh, your childhood? Um, I would describe the, my childhood, um, I've described it as living hell. But then I think about other kids that are growing up in the worst situations even, than even mine. I mean, my story pales in the light of the majority of kids who are in the system, but I feel like that God's given me this platform, this gift of experience uh, to talk about and share with many people. And, and it's shocking to a lot of people because we're not aware of these things that are going on in uh, with these kids. But if you... If you uh, I mean, on this side of it, if you will, I mean, I see it every day. I've seen it every day when I was growing up. You know, I thought it was normal. And, but now that I've been given an opportunity to share it, it's, it's pretty shocking. Well, there's so many moments. I mean, you were homeless, your mother's situation, driving away, all of that. Let's just, let's just talk about a couple moments of your life. I'm reading this book I, I'm reading, and when you're 13, your stepfather has a gun to your head. Mm. And just gripping mm -hmm. as, as I'm reading this. What was that like, not only to have that, but sort of the emotional betrayal mm -hmm. that you constantly had to find everyone around you just, mm -hmm. they were gone, they betrayed you. Yeah, it, just, it never made sense to me why they kept doing that. And it was just, a, it was abusive and it was uh, mentally abusive because the adults that I trust the most were uh, dishonest. And, you know, sitting there in the front seat of that car that night with my stepdad and him making me load the gun that he was going to shoot me with, I mean, that was, uh, you know, it was, it was just almost like a dream but or nightmare. But I was so scared. I, I don't know how he didn't shoot me, but I, I was just, I just, it all happened so fast where... You know, he pointed the gun at me and, and I moved my head and he pulled the trigger at the same time and it was just, you know, the glass breaking and I just remember it all kind of happening really fast. And when he fired the gun, there was just this moment of silence. You know, we were all kind of, he and I both were, I, I assume he was wondering if he had shot me and I was wondering if I'd been shot. And I know my head was hurting because the gun was so close to my head when he pulled the trigger, so it was my ear was ringing so bad, I didn't know if he had shot me. And then um, it's burning. But, uh, and then there was blood everywhere because, you know, he had hit me, and then so I've got all this blood on me. It was just confusing for a moment. And I, just, know. I know. Yeah, it was just scary. And, and a few years later, I think when you were 15, you're, you're in a jail. And, and later on, you become a prison guard and you go back to that same jail. Yeah. Well, what are those two experiences like where one day you're a prisoner in there and then the <laughs> next time you're in there at, 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 and the, the whole guard situation and you kind of get him back. It was yeah. fantastic. So there's some cheering in there as well. But yeah, it reads like a Hollywood movie. I mean, but it, it, was, uh, it, it really did feel, the whole story felt like almost like a movie. But, you know, when I... When I was arrested and placed in the detention center, I was r arrested because I was a runaway. And I'd ran away from a group home that I was in uh, after a kid stabbed another kid that night with a dart. They were horse playing or something, but I, I just, I'd, I was fed up with it, you know, and I ran. And I thought it would be best if I, would, if I were on my own. But um, I ended up just getting in worse shape. It was just living outside and 
you know, speaking of the cameo in the movie Paper Angels, I mean, the coat that I wore during that time when I was on the run and living outside is the coat that I wore in the cameo. And kind of a little sentimental value there. Um, but then I was picked up and placed in the detention center. And the way that that officer treated me that night, you know, I just, I never forgot it. I never forgot what he said to me. It wasn't necessarily what he made me do. You know, they make all the inmates strip and, you know, and do all that stuff. But it was the words he said to me that hurt. He was, he was very belligerent and hurt, hurtful for no reason at all. And then years later, um, not long, um, you know, three or four years later, I ended up, you know, getting on my feet, having an opportunity to go to school, and and it was a complete tur turnaround. Uh, my criminal justice, my criminal justice instructor, said we were going to go visit this detention center, and of course, I mean, I'd never shared my story with a soul because I was, I was not necessarily embarrassed of it. I just didn't want people to judge me because, you know, and I'd, I'd plan to put all that behind me and, and really never talk about it again, but. When I showed up that morning, I saw that officer, and I recognized him. And he said, "Good morning, welcome to the detention center. In, in here, we have all kinds of trash." And that was, that was just there. there he was, you know, still that being. That set you right there. It was, it was the turning point, because I, I, I was just thinking about me, you know, and who I was inside. I know I'm not trash, and I was like, you know, I've never committed a crime. I, I, I ran away, but I wasn't a criminal. And, you know, I know I'm not trash just because I'm poor doesn't mean I'm trash. And, and, and here he is telling this whole classroom that they're, these kids in here are trash. Now, some of them's committed horrific crimes, um, but we're not all trash. And, and, and I don't think any human's trash. But I had to say something to him. You know, I, I don't even, I mean, at the time, I just knew I had to say something. I didn't know what it was what was going to happen. I just said, "Hey, um, I got to tell you something." <laughs> I said, "My cell door used to be the last one on the right." And of course, now you know I'm a completely different-looking person because of the family that took me in, made me get a haircut, and you know I was wearing nicer clothes and completely different than the kid that was living outside and wearing the same clothes every day and dirty. I mean, I'd go for weeks without taking a bath, and I was just disgusting. And here I was, clean, completely different looking. But on the inside, I was still the same person that he was calling trash. And, and I, I remember I started getting really nervous and couldn't really get my words out right. And, but I got my point across, you know, that, hey, you know, these kids in here, some been abandoned by their own families. And we all make mistakes, but we're not trash. Don't call us trash again. How about that family that took you in? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you say a lot uh, about them, and it's quite remarkable. Yeah. Uh, it's moving. What were they like? What was B like? Mm -hmm. You know, I've told the story a million times, and I've never told the story the best it could be told because there's just no way to really describe how wonderful they were. I mean, they were so wonderful to me. They were 75 and 79 year, years old, and I was 16 and, and living outside, and they just loved so deeply. It was just a different kind of experience for me, I, and I was pretty sensitive to you know those emotions and everything. And so when someone showed me any love, it was deeper than what you know, you know, we take for granted sometimes. You know, hey, bye, I love you. No, <laughs> don't let that person get out the door without saying it and mean it. You know, it wasn't that kind of love. It was real, stop, and let me look at you in your face and tell you how much I appreciate you kind of love. And that's what they did. They treated me like that every day. We want you to know how much we appreciate you and how much we love you. And they, and at first I didn't trust them because I didn't trust anybody. And it took me a while. I mean, when I'd go to school, I'd, I had sandwiches in my coat because I didn't know if I was going to go home and, you know, they were going to kick me out, but um, they just never let me down, ever. Remarkable story, and I, I'm just curious because your book reads with, with the, the depth of feeling that you have, the things that happened to you, your music also 
You know, I think that people are drawn to it, not just because of the lyrics and because of the, uh, the, the sing, but the passion and the emotion you put into that. How, how much do you think the pain and the things that happened in your life uh, actually reflect in, in your success later on? Well, <laughs> I've jokingly said before, when things are going really well, I'm probably the most miserable because I function very normally under stress and struggle. And so <laughs> I'm bored to death when things are, are great and I have to create some type of drama. You know, in my house, I'll start a project and it'd just be a strenuous project. It'd be something that, like walking halfway across America, <laughs> it's just, there has to be something that's pushing me like not normal stuff. And then, you know, was, I... That is not normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I suffered with a little when bit. When did you realize it was not normal? <laughs> by, <laughs> by, by the second step. <laughs> like, no, about, um, about four days into it, I was depressed, out of my mind. But I've always been depressed. You know, I've always dealt with it. And I deal with it through my art, through my writing. And that's why it sounds the way it sounds. I mean, when you hear the songs, it's just me being depressed out of my mind and putting it on paper. And, and um, people say to me, you know, man, well, how did you turn out so normal? And I'm like, <laughs> if you only knew what goes on behind closed doors. I mean, I, I live alone. I don't go out and really socialize very much. And I don't know, I, I just, I think a lot and, you know, I struggle with a lot of depression. So, and that's okay because, you know, I get to use that. I figured out how to funnel it and, and funnel it through my music. But then when I go out and play the music and, and the people come back to me with their stories about how they were inspired by the book, man, that, I'm telling you, that's just, you know, I'm like, God, thank you so much for that. That's just, it really helps me then. And I'm really, you know, every time I hear a story, that's helping me put myself back together, if you will. It's kind of a weird, twisted way, but... We don't wish more depression on you, no. but we love the work that comes out from it. So. <laughs> well, see, can nothing you can really, can't really control it, I guess, unless you... I just don't want to... I don't know. I, 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 uh, I just think that being able to write the songs and tell the stories and hear people's response and how they've been helped I mean, that really helps me well it helps a lot of people we're here at the yeah. salvation army this mm -hmm. uh, P paper angels movie and the book i think are inspiring uh, but if there, ever there's a story if somebody thinks that one person can't make a difference or that your past doesn't define your future i think you're uh, you're the perfect example of it so thank thanks you so much for talking absolutely skip thank you so much